I think of you on my bed throughout the night, God. I think of you because you help and I'm safe, God. I think of you as I sing under your wings, God. I think of you and feel your hand as you uphold me. God, you are my God, you're the only one I seek, God, you are my God, I'm in the desert and I'm thirsty, God, you are my God, I know you're in your sanctuary, God, you are my God, I've seen your power. you help and I'm safe, God. I think of you as I sing under your wings, God. I think of you and feel your hand as you uphold me.
The worship is on the screen. <laughs> Our opening song is Resurrection Hymn. All the children come forward, please, for the children's message. Do you think you guys can sit right on this bottom step so everybody can see your faces? Do you think we can do that? I did see that. Hey, Noah. What a special day it is today. Do you know what today is? Easter. It's Easter. Now, good morning, good morning. Can we sit on the bottom row, or can we sit on the second row if you want? Oh, I'll try. Okay, good morning, everybody. Now, our Sunday school classes have been very busy during the time of Lent. Now, some of you were here on most of the weeks, and some of you might not have been here on any week. So I think we're going to have to play a game. 
Yeah. And how about if we have audience participation? Yeah. yeah? Okay, everybody ready? All right, so we, taught, we, we gathered together items to remind us about um, the time of Lent, and the story that we learned about was from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, so we call that Holy Week. All right, so we filled each egg with something very special to make us think about what happened during these particular events. All right, so let's see how you do. Okay, egg number one. Okay, Jesus rode something into Jerusalem, and people waved palm branches. We talked about this last Sunday was Palm Sunday. Does anybody remember what Jesus was riding on? Oh, who said it? Yay, a donkey. So we have a donkey in our eggs, and this is by far the cutest little donkey I ever did see. I wish you all could see this little donkey. He fits in the egg, believe it or not. All right, so after that, let's see. Oh, Judas betrayed Jesus. He was going to betray him, and... We put something in here to remind us what he was going to betray Jesus for. Money. Money. Yeah, there's coins in here. Can you? Were you here for that? For that one? No. Well, Jesus was ready to betray, or Judas was ready to betray Jesus just for money. Hmm. It doesn't seem like a good thing to do. All right. So next. Jesus is a very strange thing, and Pastor Bill talked about this um, last week. Jesus actually washed his disciples' feet, which is something that a king would never do. But to symbolize Jesus washing his disciples' feet is a towel. towel. Oh, so smart. They're so smart. All right, we have a towel in here, a very small towel. Okay. Good job. Good job. So far, I haven't fooled you. Okay. Oh, uh oh. Emerson. Oh, dear. Okay. All right. Everybody have a seat. My little helpers. Okay. Here's something we're going to do today. But on Thursday, we. Um, can you sit down, please? No, I want the blue one. Okay. Here, you can have this one, okay? Okay. You can have the dog. Okay. So they had something called the Last Supper. Will Jesus gathered his disciples, and he said, take this bread and eat it, and this is my body, to remind me that this is my body. And then he took a cup, and he said, give thanks, and he said, drink it, this is my blood for the covenant, which is poured out for many of you, for the forgiveness of sins, something we're going to do later on today, and it is the cup. We've got our little communion cup. Good job, Ella. All right, that was number four. We're moving right along, folks. All right, number five, Jesus takes time to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Does anybody remember what we put in here to remind us of when he was praying in the garden? Yes, good job, a flower. Good job. That's amazing. All right, number six. Okay, this kind of makes me a little sad, but Jesus was whipped. He was flogged and handed over to be crucified. Does anybody remember what we put in here to remind us, remind us of when he was whipped? Do you know what's in here? No. Nope. Not a not a spear, but hang on. It is. Anybody want to guess? He was whipped. Okay. To symbolize the whip, we have a little tiny little piece of leather here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next. Number seven, Jesus is crucified, and he was hung on the, yes, on the cross. And we have a nice little cross in here to remind us of that. All right. Um, oh, next. Oh, these soldiers, boy, I'll tell you. They were doing a little gambling, and they were playing a game to see who was going to win. Jesus is close. Oh. Yes, dice. There's little dice in here. Well, one die. Yes. Okay. All right. And let's see. We're getting there. Okay, next, the soldiers pierced Jesus to make sure he was dead. They pierced him with a... What? A spear. 
spear. That's right. We have a very small and dull spear. <laughs> All right. Only two more to go, folks. Uh, number 10. Well, three more. 10. Jesus' body was wrapped for burial, and they wrapped him in... Oh, boy. Somebody stole my number 10. Oh, here's number 10. Okay. They wrapped him in a... Cloth, a linen. So we have a little cloth to remind us of that. Okay, and number 11. I think number 11 just went flying. Number 11 is they sealed Jesus in a tomb. They sealed him with a big rock. We had a very small rock in our egg. All right, now here's the most important one of all. The most important one of all. Number 12. Okay. On Easter morning, I think we're losing some of them. On Easter morning, Jesus was risen from the dead. Do you remember what we put in this egg to remind us of Jesus in the tomb? I no. did. Oh, we did. We put Jesus in the tomb. Do you think he's in here? Yeah. Let's see. Let's oh, see. Open. Go ahead. You can open it. Is he in there? Oh! <gasps> He's gone. He's not in the egg. He's not in the tomb. He's not in the grave. He's alive. That's right. So we have to remember that he's no longer in the tomb. And on Easter morning, they, they realized that he was alive. Can everybody say he's alive? Ready? One more time. He's alive. One more time. He's alive. Okay. And we actually did have a little Jesus that they all took home. All right. Thanks, you guys. We don't have Sunday school, but we're going to say a quick prayer before you go back to your seats. Can you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious Easter story. Thank you for the sacrifice you were willing to make with your very own son so we can live with you in your heavenly kingdom forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. I think we're going to give Laura maybe a purple heart. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well done. It's sort of like us, isn't it, and our Lord? Our Lord is trying to teach us, but we're paying attention some of the time, and some of the time we're not. Other times we're just not connected. Well done. I was thinking as I was sitting here and I was watching our about Katie. Uh, she was the one playing uh, the piano. And you may have noticed that she was playing her, uh, the piano uh, in her stocking feet, or bare feet, I guess. And uh, um, that reminded me of my first organist, Maida Clemmy, a young minister. She was about 835 years old, I think. Me. You know how you see things when you're young, everybody's so old. Wonderful woman. Just lived uh, down the block from us. And she played the organ in her stocking feet. She'd sit over here and she'd play the organ and her feet would move back and forth all over. It was kind of mesmerizing. And she had the choir over here and, 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 and that particular choir, uh, and I mean this very respectfully, Everybody just kind of grabbed a note. <laughs> yeah. And they sang. And uh, it all came together so very beautifully, but on different octaves and in different uh, tenors, basses, and they would slide. Some of the women would slide from soprano to bass. It was amazing uh, how they would do that. But it was, a, it was marvelous. It was an inspiration I'll always remember. So... Um, and Kate's following 
grand style here, not wearing any stockings, just bare feet. We have a wonderful gift that if we take it seriously, it frees us to live anew and unburdened by remembrances. That is our confession, our prayer of confession. You are all invited to join me in our congregational prayer of confession. Let us speak to our Lord together. Father, forgive us for we fall short of your expectations. So often we live as pre-Easter people. We are stiff and stifled in our joy and proclamation. We fear criticism, humiliation, and defeat. Help us to realize that the way of the cross is uneven and costly but that it always leads to joy and resurrection. We pray that Jesus triumphed over death, would generate in us the faith we need to overcome the humiliation and defeat we meet in our own daily encounters. Amen. For those who have come forward in their hearts in sincerity, hear this. And rejoice, for God has loved you so very much that he has given his only begotten son, that if we only believe in him, we shall not perish, but we shall have everlasting life. We are a forgiven people. Undeserved as it is, he forgives us. Praise be to God. Amen. and the glory of glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be As many of you know, in the back of the church, there are offering plates for your offerings to be put in on your way into the sanctuary or the way out of the sanctuary. We don't pass the offering plates during the service itself. But nevertheless, we remember from whenceforth our gifts come, and we want to acknowledge that and to highlight it. And so... I read a sentence of offering. We ask, Father, that you, excuse me, wrong one. If you close your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry out yourself and not be heard. Proverbs 21, verse 13. Let us pray together our offertory prayer. Father, we present these gifts so people may continue to benefit from the ministry of this church, so couples may be united in marriage, so parents may bring their children for consecration, so inquirers may find answers to their questions, so the trouble may find an open ear, so the sick may be visited, so the word may be proclaimed, and so your people may continue to worship in a place of holy beauty. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> uh, 
Our scripture this morning will be taken from Mark. Mark is the earliest gospel ever written. So in account of the resurrection of Jesus. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices <clears throat> so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And they entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed, for you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror, and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I could barely see her, but there was a beautiful little blonde girl who was singing soprano. 
Where is she? There she is. Right over here in the corner. Maybe you all couldn't see her, but she was mouthing the words and dancing right along. We are certainly blessed with musical people in this congregation. We have them every Sunday, with Tim and a little choir. And we have them this morning in front, making this not only a holy and a blessed day, but one that's even more glorious. So thank you for coming together and singing as you have rolling the stone away. It means a lot to many of us. Thank you. Maybe more than you know. Thank you. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is risen and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. Go tell Peter. Go tell Peter. That's speaking to each one of us, actually. You remember how Peter, Peter was the one who first identified that Jesus was the Messiah. No one else had, but he did. And Jesus said to him, you didn't discover that on your own. But God had placed that in your heart. I'll read it. Mark, chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, another Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And Matthew tells us that after he declared that, Peter said, uh, Jesus said to Peter, you are the rock upon which I'll build my church. In that declaration, you are the Messiah. And so are we not like Peter in that at some point in our lives, all of us here have felt that indeed Jesus is our Messiah. And we praise God for allowing our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, and we come forward and we say, praise God. Christ, you are my Messiah. You have saved me. And then Peter, later with the, with the disciples in the upper room, has communion with God. Christ with Jesus. Jesus tells them, you're my body, you are my blood. We are together as a corporate unity. We are indeed one in the spirit. And then he tells them that he is going to die. He's going to be betrayed. And once he's betrayed and they come to get him, the flock will scatter. But guess who? It is Peter who says, I will never, ever abandon you, even if I die. Let me read it. From Mark chapter 14, 29. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now remember that. He's declaring what he's going to do while he's alive. I'm going to Galilee, and you will be with me. But Peter said to him, even though all desert you, I will not. 
Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will have denied me three times. But Peter said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will never deny you. And all of them, all of them said the same thing. And now we're not like Peter. When we come to be, when we become a part of a congregation, a family of Christians, we make our vows, we join the church, and we say that we'll never abandon our Christ. We'll never deny our Christ, our Messiah. Never. We are very much like Peter. Even if we die, we will not deny our Christ. And then we read in Mark 14 of Peter. Once those who had come from the Sanhedrin, the council with arms to arrest Jesus in the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, the flock, just as Christ said, scatters, even Peter. And they lead Jesus away to go on trial before the council or the Sanhedrin. And Peter is following, but from a distance, a safe distance. So while Peter was below in the courtyard now, and Christ is above in the council being tried, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began to say to the bystanders, you know, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly, you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore, an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. And at that very moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Aren't we just like Peter? Aren't many of us like Peter very often, although some of us may not be? That when we are in the midst of doing something wrong, we fail to hear the cock crow even once. So caught up are we in the doing that which is not right whatever it is called by. And then all of a sudden, by the grace of God, it seems like we hear the cock crow twice and we become aware that what we are thinking, what we are speaking, and what we are doing does not illustrate the teachings or the love of Jesus Christ. And because we happen to love our Messiah very much, we do break down and cry. Very bitter tears. And quite often, initially, we feel that we no longer 
belong to Christ. For we have defiled our faith. And it's very tragic. Sometimes I listen to fellow clergy as a counselor, therapist, as they grieve bitterly over their sins. They love God, Christ, very much, these people I'm thinking of, and yet they have done wrong. And they blame themselves. And it's difficult for them to forgive themselves. They hear that Christ forgives them, but they don't forgive themselves. They need to hear Christ forgiving them, apparently, often. There is a Peter within us all. We forget our faith. And we don't realize it until we are into it, and then we kind of wake up. But this has to stop. Peter is within us all. And yet, the first Peter, who becomes aware of denying Christ three times and is weeping bitterly, flees in disgrace and dishonor and humiliation and regret. He's denied his Lord disobeyed. Point of fact, he was a traitor. We often blame Judas Iscariot as the traitor. Peter was a traitor. And there may be a traitor in all of us. But then listen. This is so beautiful. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. Isn't that beautiful? Go tell Peter that I love him. <laughs> go tell Peter that I hold no animosity towards him. Go tell Peter he's still one of us. Go tell Peter he's forgiven. Go tell Peter that I have risen. Go tell Peter. Go tell Peter. And the other disciples of my unconditional love for him. And that I do not reject him. And that there's nothing that can separate him, no matter what he's done, from my love. My love is consistent and constant for him. We call this, and it's in an old hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? Many of you will know it. What wondrous love is this? It's, it's indescribable. How, how, how can you describe it? It's a wondrous love beyond anything we are able to achieve with any consistency and constancy. It's a wondrous love. Go tell Peter. And so, with Peter, I'm sure, we sing because we are happy. We sing because we are forever loved. We sing because we are Easter's people. We are embraced by God's wondrous love. And it is within our hearts. A love that has transformed how we see ourselves and how we see the world at large, how we see other people. 
direction of our life is forever changed because of this wonderful, wondrous love. We see ourselves as ambassadors of mercy, of grace, of forgiveness, just as he did. See, our love as Christians is an action oriented love. We cannot just come, read the scriptures, hear them read to us, and then go out and live our life as though we've never heard them. No. They are life to us. Peter. Peter knew in his heart of hearts that he was one with God, although he was ashamed that he could not stand by his side elbow to elbow during his Christ trial, tribulations. But he regained himself when he heard Christ reaching out to him. To hear that he had been resurrected from the dead, so mysterious, so unexplainable, and that he was going ahead of him, just as he said, just after the upper room communion, that I'll meet you in Galilee. So we see ourselves as being these ambassadors as Christ was. We see our purpose for being born is to serve God in whatever voice we hear him. We all hear God speaking to us in different ways. One way doesn't disqualify another way. And so, in serving God, we tend to sheep as best we can. We help those who are lost, those who have no home, those who, have, who, who are lonely, those who are crippled or maimed or diseased. We help them. We help our neighbor. We help one another. It's a wondrous love that we are living into and out of. Just as Jesus did, so do we. That's why we want to know more and more about this Jesus of Nazareth. That we are able to give this wondrous love to a world and to a society that too often values other things over the well-being of children and adults and other human beings. We don't have to look far to see other human beings being so devalued in war. It is so sad. And yet, right alongside this tragedy that's occurring in Europe, we see wondrous love in people. Poland and elsewhere, giving of their time, giving of their energy, giving of their finances, giving of their food, giving of their employment to help refugees survive. What a wondrous love is being displayed there, and there lies our hope. We're looking in the other direction. What is there to see but our inhumanity to each other? In Jesus, in his resurrection, in his life-giving spirit that we identify with, we seek to bring peace and harmony into a broken world, each one of us. And we are determined not one step backwards. Not one step backwards. I must say, if I may digress for a moment, that would be a term that Putin would understand. Because that's what Stalin told his army 
when they were confronting the Nazis. And they were being beaten quite badly at that point. He told his army not one step backwards. And they went forward. Of course, there were lines of machine guns behind the army that if anybody retreated, they were shot. True. So you took either way, ahead or behind. But you'd understand the determination in that word. Not one step backwards. And so we, too, incorporate that in our pilgrimage as a Christian. We seek not to take one step backward and become a part of the problem in, instead of one who seeks to resolve the problem. So, dear friends, I bring you great joy this morning, even in the midst of a challenging, difficult world that we have been brought into during our lifetimes. There have been other challenging and difficult times, but in our lifetime, we have our share now. And it's up to us, each of us, to do what we can as servants to embrace this wondrous love of forgiveness and steadfast love and to be, be the example to the world, to be the ambassadors of the world, of a Christ that forgives, that a Christ that seeks to heal, that a Christ that offers peace, love, and mercy, not to a select few, but to all, regardless of color, sexual orientation, regardless of race, regardless of religion. It's given. Can you imagine that? It's given. It's a wondrous love. And there's an extra piece to it, which we celebrate. It's everlasting life. That's given. That's assured. We're all going to get that. Everlasting life. I may even see my mother-in-law there. <laughs> that might not be so happy on her end, but... Uh, <laughs> it's a glorious moment go tell Peter everything is okay between us and we're going to be in heaven together go tell him that it's good news it's our good news too praise be to God for this good news happy Easter everyone that Easter is for you. That Easter is for me. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And now we go to communion. I can almost see us sitting in the upper room around the table. <laughs> Maybe you can image that in your mind's eye. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate as a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, Jesus establishes a new and eternal covenant with God that we a covenant of reconciliation and grace that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world or the end of life. 
in the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us into a life eternal. And in this cupping of blessing, he comes to us as the true vine in which we must abide if we too are to ever bear fruit. And we come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love, of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled eyes we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. And since by his death and resurrection and ascension he has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body, so are we to receive this supper in true brotherly and sisterly love, mindful of the communion of saints, or those who have gone before us. Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, indeed by Judas, he took the bread with his disciples, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body that will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup of blessing. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Just do this in remembrance of me. Now you are mine, and there's nothing that can ever separate you from me. Nothing you can do. Dear friends, you may take the tab off your little containers and take a piece of bread. The bread that we break is the sharing in of the life of Jesus Christ. Take and eat all of it. And now the other side, and be careful, spilling it on yourself, the juice. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion, the sharing in, in the blood of Jesus Christ. Take and drink all of it. Dear Lord and Savior, as you have fed us at your table, in our darkest hours, as we go through this journey of life, may we always remember this communion. May we always remember your presence. May we know that we are invited to hang on to this, to latch on to it, and find our strength, to find our encouragement, to find our patience, to find our hope. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And now won't you join me in our prayer petition? Let us pray to God. Realizing that we are sometimes negative in our thinking and critical in our opinion of others, we ask that you will heal our attitudes, help us to greet each new day with anticipation, expecting the best. Remind us to try to understand others before condemning or criticizing them. Help us to be sensitive to the feelings of others and not to look down on them because they have different likes or dislikes that we have. Help us to be open to suggestions and correction. May other defects in us require hope, Christian confidence, and may they see in us a reflection of the compassion of 
Jesus Christ. Write these words upon our hearts, dear Lord, and be with those who cannot be with us this day because of illness, such as with Brianna, Wendy's niece, and other people in nursing homes that are a part of our congregation, and those beyond our doors who know you not, nor if they know you, they don't care very much of learning from you. Enable us in our attitudes and who we are to be your missionaries. In Jesus Christ's name, hear this our prayer and the prayer that you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Alas, him, Jesus Christ is risen today. Jesus Christ is risen today, alleluia, our triumph in holy day, alleluia, who did once a friends, go forth in peace, that peace that comes from knowing God intimately. Exit and go into the world as Easter's people. That is who we are, Easter people. Let us praise God with our lives. Amen. Amen. Amen.